Hey everyone, welcome to the medical podcast, Curio Roar Health. Subscribe to the podcast or don't. Take control of your own life. Today we're talking about antibiotics. Oh yeah, a true game changer. They really did revolutionize how we treat infections. It is amazing. It's amazing to think how something so small yeah. could have such a huge impact on human health. Huge. It's easy to forget how life was before antibiotics. Right. For centuries, the average life expectancy hovered around 40 years. Wow. Diseases like plague, syphilis, and tuberculosis were basically death sentences. Yeah, it's a stark contrast to today where those diseases are largely treatable thanks to antibiotics. Right. But the road to discovering these miracle drugs wasn't straightforward. No, it wasn't. Let's go back to the very beginning before scientists even knew about germs. How did they even start to understand what was causing these deadly diseases? Well, it all began with um, a curious Dutchman named Antony van Leeuwenhoek back in the 17th century. Okay. He was obsessed with building microscopes, and he was the first one to see bacteria. These tiny animals, as he called them, swimming around everywhere. So he was the first one to actually see these microscopic creatures uh -huh. that were causing so much havoc. Yes. That must have been a mind-blowing discovery. It really was. Yeah. But Vane Leeuwenhoek was a bit of an outsider yeah. in the scientific community, and he kept his discoveries mostly to himself. Oh, wow. It took a while for the world to grasp the significance of his findings. Yeah, it makes you wonder how many other groundbreaking discoveries are out there just waiting to be shared with the world. Right. So how did the medical community finally make the connection between these tiny animals and the diseases that were plaguing humanity. It took almost two centuries for that leap in understanding to occur. Wow. A surgeon named Joseph Lister was horrified by the death rates in hospitals. Yeah. Over 40% of patients were dying from infections after surgery. That's an unbelievably high number. It is. Today, the risk of a post-surgical infection is significantly lower. For sure. What did Lister do to change things? Well, he had read Louis Pasteur's work on germ theory, right. and he was convinced that these microscopic organisms were the culprits behind these infections. Okay. So Lister started using carbolic acid as an antiseptic to kill germs before they could infect surgical wounds. That's incredible. He was basically pioneering sterile techniques in surgery. Yeah. And I'm guessing that had a dramatic impact on patient survival rates. Absolutely. Lister's work was revolutionary. Yeah. It laid the foundation for modern surgery and infection control. Okay. But we still hadn't discovered antibiotics as we know them today. So where did the idea for a magic billet, right. a drug that could specifically target and kill microbes, come from? Yeah. That's where Paul Ehrlich enters the picture, right? Exactly. Ehrlich was a fascinating character, a bit of a maverick scientist who wasn't afraid to think outside the box. Yeah. He was obsessed with this idea of a magic bullet, mm -hmm. a substance that could selectively target and destroy disease-causing microbes without harming the host. It sounds like something out of a science fiction novel. Yeah. What inspired him to pursue this idea? He was intrigued by dyes. Okay. And how they could stain specific tissues differently. Right. He theorized that you could apply the same principle to microbes. Oh, find a substance that would bind specifically to a microbe and destroy it. It's amazing how observing something seemingly unrelated can start a groundbreaking idea. Yeah. So did Ehrlich ever find his magic bullet? He did. He did. His research led to the discovery of Salversen. Okay. An early treatment for syphilis. Oh, wow. It was a major breakthrough at the time. Yeah. Proving that his concept of targeted therapy could work. It's inspiring to think that one person's vision could have such a profound impact on medicine. For sure. But Salverson wasn't an antibiotic in the true sense, right? Correct. Okay. Well, it was a major step forward. Yeah. Salverson was an arsenic-based compound, not a true antibiotic. Okay. But around the same time, another significant discovery was made, sulfa drugs. Ah, uh, yes, sulfa drugs. They were some of the first widely used antimicrobial agents. Mm -hmm. What's the story behind their discovery? It's another fascinating tale. Okay. Gerhard Domac, uh -huh. a German scientist, was working with dyes as well. Okay. He found that a dye called Prontosil Red was surprisingly effective at treating bacterial infections in mice. Wow. Huh. In a desperate moment, he even used it to treat his own daughter's strep infection. Wow. And it worked. Wow. That's yeah. a testament to a father's love and a scientist's conviction. It is. But how did these sulfa drugs actually work against bacteria? They work by interfering with bacteria's ability to produce folic acid, okay. which is essential for their growth and survival. Uh -huh. It's like cutting off their food supply. 
Fascinating. So we have Ehrlich's magic bullet concept mm. paving the way for targeted therapy, sulfa drugs, disrupting bacterial metabolism. All of this happening before the discovery of penicillin. Uh-huh. It seems like the world was on the verge of a major breakthrough. Exactly. And it's important to remember that penicillin wasn't a sudden eureka moment. Right. People had been using mold to treat infections for centuries. Oh, really? Scientists in the early 20th century were actively studying mold and its effects on other microbes. So Alexander Swang's famous observation of mold inhibiting bacterial growth in his Petri dish wasn't a complete accident? It was a combination of keen observation and scientific curiosity. Okay. Flying noticed that the mold Penicillium notidum yeah. was producing something that killed the bacteria. Okay. He called the substance penicillin. Right. But isolating and producing enough of it for clinical trials was a whole other challenge. This is where Howard Florey and Ernst Chain come into the picture, right? Precisely. The dynamic trio who brought penicillin to the world. They faced enormous challenges oh, in nice. purifying and mass-producing penicillin. I can imagine. Imagine trying to extract a tiny amount of substance yeah. from a messy mold culture and then figuring out how to produce it on a large scale. It must have been a logistical nightmare. It was. How did they finally overcome these obstacles? It was a combination of scientific ingenuity, persistence, and a bit of luck. They had some early success treating patients, mm -hmm. but there's a tragic story of one of the first patients treated with penicillin who ultimately died because they simply didn't have enough of the drug. That's heartbreaking, yeah. but it highlights the early struggles of antibiotic development. Yeah. So what finally pushed penicillin production into high gear? World War II. Uh -huh. The need for effective treatments for battlefield infections became urgent. Right. The war effort drove researchers and pharmaceutical companies to mass produce penicillin, and it saved countless lives. A true turning point in medical history. But even with penicillin becoming a widespread treatment, mm -hmm. the story of antibiotic discovery didn't end there, did it? Not at all. Okay. In fact, the discovery of penicillin opened the floodgates for a golden age of antibiotic discovery. This is where Selman Waxman comes in, right? Exactly. The scientist who coined the term antibiotic itself. Waxman and his student Albert Schatz discovered streptomycin, okay. which was another game changer in the fight against bacterial infections. It was effective against bacteria that penicillin couldn't touch, like the bacteria that causes tuberculosis. So the search for new and more effective antibiotics continued even after the success of penicillin. Yeah. It seems like a natural progression given how revolutionary these drugs were. It makes sense, right? Yeah. Penicillin was a game changer, but scientists knew that relying on a single antibiotic wouldn't be enough in the long run. It's almost like they had a premonition of what was to come. Right. The rise of antibiotic resistance. Yeah. But before we dive into that, can we take a step back and explore how these antibiotics actually work? Of course. That's a crucial part of the story. Right. Understanding how antibiotics work is key to understanding why antibiotic resistance is such a serious threat. Absolutely. Yeah. Antibiotics work because they exploit the natural defenses that bacteria have developed over Three. millions of years to compete with each other. Uh -huh. We've basically figured out how to use their own weapons against them. So we're borrowing from nature's playbook to fight bacterial infections. Right. That's pretty ingenious. Yeah. But how many different ways do these antibiotics actually work? I mean, do they all attack bacteria in the same way? Not at all. Okay. There are actually a few main strategies. Yep. Some antibiotics, like penicillin, mm -hmm. target the bacterial cell wall. Okay. They basically prevent bacteria from building and maintaining their protective outer layer. Right. Which causes them to burst open and die. So it's like attacking the bacteria's fortress wall. Yeah. Leaving them vulnerable. Exactly. Hmm. Other antibiotics work by interfering with bacterial protein synthesis. Uh -huh. They disrupt the bacteria's ability to create essential proteins. Okay. Which are needed for all sorts of cellular functions. So it's like sabotaging their factories, yeah. disrupting their ability to produce the building blocks they need to function. That's a great analogy. Thanks. And then there are antibiotics that target bacterial DNA replication. Okay. They prevent bacteria from copying their genetic material, uh -huh. which essentially stops them from multiplying. So these antibiotics are like putting the brakes on bacterial reproduction. Exactly. Okay. And some antibiotics interfere with bacterial metabolism, okay. disrupting the chemical processes that are essential for their survival. It's fascinating how scientists have figured out all these different ways to target bacteria. It is. Like a multi-pronged attack 
on their survival mechanisms. It really is. Yeah. And this diversity in how antibiotics work is part of what makes them so effective. Okay. But it's also why antibiotic resistance is such a complex challenge. Okay. So let's talk about antibiotic resistance. Yeah. It's a term we hear all the time, but I'm not sure everyone fully understands what it means or how serious the problem is. You're right. It's a topic that deserves more attention. Yeah. Essentially, antibiotic resistance occurs when bacteria evolve to survive the effects of antibiotics that were once effective against them. Right. It's like an arms race between us and the bacteria. So the more we use antibiotics, the more we're pushing bacteria to evolve and become resistant. Ah, exactly. Every time we use an antibiotic, we're putting selective pressure on bacteria. Uh -huh. The bacteria that are most susceptible to the antibiotic die off. Okay. But the ones that have some level of resistance survive and reproduce. It's like survival of the fittest, but for bacteria. Yeah. The resistant ones are the ones that thrive and pass on their resistance genes to their offspring. Precisely. And the more we use antibiotics, the faster we drive this process of resistance. Right. It's like we're accelerating their evolution. All right. So what are some of the main drivers of antibiotic resistance? What are we doing that's making this problem worse? One of the biggest culprits is the overuse and misuse of antibiotics. Okay. People often take antibiotics for viral infections like colds or the flu. Right. Which is completely ineffective since antibiotics only target bacteria. Right. Antibiotics can't kill viruses. Yeah. So taking them for a viral infection is pointless. Right. And potentially harmful because it exposes your body's bacteria to the antibiotic. Yes. Increasing the chances of resistance developing. Exactly. Another common problem is not completing the full course of antibiotics prescribed by a doctor. Oh, yeah. I've definitely been guilty of that in the past. Lots of people have. I figure if I start feeling better, I don't need to finish all the pills right. That's a common misconception, but it's actually one of the biggest drivers of resistance. Really? When you don't finish the full course, you might kill off the weakest bacteria. Okay. But leave behind the more resistant ones, which can then multiply and spread. So I'm actually doing more harm than good by stopping my antibiotics early. Unfortunately, yes. Wow. And it's not just about individual behavior. Okay. The widespread use of antibiotics in livestock is a major contributor to resistance as well. Wait, they give antibiotics to animals. Why is that? It's often used preventatively in large-scale farming operations to boost growth and prevent infections in crowded, unsanitary conditions. That's concerning. It is. So we're essentially creating breeding grounds for resistant bacteria in these factory farms, and those resistant bacteria can then spread to humans. It's a very real concern. Wow. And this highlights the fact that antibiotic resistance is a complex, multifaceted problem. Yeah. It's not just about individual choices. It's about how we use antibiotics as a society. It sounds like a systemic problem that requires systemic solutions. Uh -huh. It's not enough to just tell people to take their antibiotics properly. We need to address the root causes of overuse and misuse. Absolutely. And we also need to invest in research and development to find new antibiotics and alternative therapies to combat resistant infections. For sure. So where do we go from here? Are we doomed to a future where antibiotics no longer work? It's a serious threat, but it's not a hopeless declaration. Okay. We can still turn the tide, but it requires a concerted effort from individuals, healthcare providers, policymakers, and the scientific community. It sounds like we need a multi-pronged approach. Yeah. We need to educate the public about the importance of responsible antibiotic use, promote better stewardship practices in healthcare settings, regulate antibiotic use in agriculture, and invest in research to find new solutions. Exactly. We need to act now to preserve the effectiveness of antibiotics for future generations. Speaking of acting now, let's shift our focus to a region that's facing the consequences of antibiotic resistance in a very real and alarming way, India. Yeah. India has become a sort of epicenter for antibiotic resistance. Yeah. Why is that? Well, there are a number of factors at play. Okay. Poverty and limited access to health care mean that many people rely on self-medication, mm. often buying antibiotics over the counter without a prescription. So there's a lot of unsupervised antibiotic use happening, which, as we discussed earlier, can fuel resistance. Exactly. Okay. And because antibiotics are widely available and relatively inexpensive in India, right. they're often used inappropriately, yeah. even for viral infections. It sounds like a perfect storm for breeding antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Unfortunately, it is. Yeah. And the situation is compounded pounded by the fact that India has a high burden of infectious diseases to begin with. Right. So antibiotic use is already widespread. Are there any specific examples of antibiotic resistance in India that illustrate 
how serious the problem is. One alarming example is the emergence of a gene called NDM1, okay. which stands for New Delhi Metallo-Beta-Lactamase. This mm -hmm. gene can make bacteria resistant to a wide range of antibiotics, oh, uh... including carbopenems, okay. which are often considered our last resort drugs. So these NDM1 bacteria are essentially superbugs that are resistant to many of our most powerful antibodies. That's right. Wow. And the scary part is that this gene can easily spread from one type of bacteria to another. Oh, wow. Further amplifying the problem. No, it's not just a localized issue within India. Right. These resistant bacteria could potentially spread globally. Exactly. That's a major concern, especially with medical tourism. Right. People travel to India for affordable health care. Yeah. And they could unknowingly bring back these resistant bacteria to their home countries. It's a stark reminder that antibiotic resistance is a global issue that requires a global response. What steps are being taken to address this problem in India and around the world? Well, there's growing awareness of the problem, okay, cool. which is a positive first step. Yeah. In India, the government has implemented stricter regulations on antibiotic sales. Okay. And there are campaigns to educate the public about responsible antibiotic use. It sounds like they're taking some important steps in the right direction. Yeah. What about the global efforts? Um, there are a number of international organizations working to combat antibiotic resistance, okay. including the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Okay. They're promoting surveillance programs to track the spread of resistance, uh -huh. developing guidelines for antibiotic use, okay. and supporting research into new antibiotics and alternative therapies. It's encouraging to know that there's a concerted global effort to tackle this problem. Yeah. But what can we do as individuals to contribute to the solution? We all have a role to play in preserving the effectiveness of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is to use them responsibly. Okay. Only take antibiotics when prescribed by a doctor right. and always complete the full course as directed, right. even if you start feeling better sooner. It's a simple but crucial message. Yeah. We can't stress that enough. Right. And we can also advocate for policies that promote responsible antibiotic use, like stricter regulations on antibiotic use in agriculture and investments in research for new treatments? For sure. It sounds like it's a combination of individual actions and systemic changes that will ultimately make the difference. Exactly. It's a collective effort that requires everyone to do their part. Well, this has been an incredibly informative and thought-provoking conversation. Yeah, it has. I feel like I've gained a much deeper understanding of the history of antibiotics, mm -hmm. the science behind how they work, and the very real threat of antibiotic resistance. I'm glad to hear that. It's a topic I'm passionate about, and I hope we've empowered our listeners to make informed decisions about their health and to advocate for responsible antibiotic use. It's definitely given me a lot to think about, and I'm sure our listeners feel the same way. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. It's been my pleasure. This was the Medical Podcast, Curio Roar Health. The next episode might hold something that could save your life one day. It's your choice. Come back or walk away.